Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the presentation today on Western Library's John Davis Barnett Shakespeare Collection. My name is Deborah Merritt Williston and I'm Special Collections Librarian in the Archives and Special Collections at Western Libraries at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. I would like to start today by acknowledging that Western University and London, Ontario is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lunapuak, and Attawandaran people. And we thank them and all Indigenous people of Turtle Island, North America, for sharing their land with us. The presentation today is based on a year-long project completed by graduate student Blake Robertson, working closely with Professor Scott Schofield as academic supervisor and myself as library supervisor. And it's the first of a series of webinars over the next year featuring scholarly work related to the Barnett Legacy Project, a collaboration of Western Libraries, the Public Humanities at Western, and the Words Festival in London, Ontario. Our webinar series is focused on John Davis Barnett's storied collection of over 40,000 books and pamphlets, um, which he donated to Western University in 1918. Each webinar will feature Western scholars and researchers who will tell stories about the collection and share some of its treasures. Our next live event will be September the 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, that's Toronto, New York time, and will feature King's University College Professor Ian Ray, who will present how John Davis Barnett helped to found the Stratford Shakespearean Festival of Canada. And there uh, should be a link in the chat to register for that event right now, if you would like. We welcome everyone to join us um, for this free public series and all of our webinars will also be recorded and made available on the university website. I'd like to thank Western Libraries for supporting this project and for the many Western Libraries staff who supported the project behind the scenes during a time when access to rare books, uh, rare book material uh, due to the pandemic made things a little more challenging than usual. And also a big thank you to the folks in the Arts and Humanities Department at Western who are also supporting this project. Blake is a fourth year doctoral candidate in the Department of English and Writing Studies at Western. Broadly speaking, Blake's research investigates the impact of early modern textual networks on playhouse dramas of Shakespeare and his contemporaries, as well as the shaping of Shakespearean textual criticism and editing through the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. Scott is associated, Associate Professor at the Department of English and Cultural Studies at Huron University College. He is an early modern scholar with expertise in book history. His past publications include articles on Shakespeare, Renaissance private libraries, and note-taking practices. In 2016, he was lead curator for a collaborative Shakespeare 400 exhibition at Toronto's Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. He is co-editor with Andy Silva of Digital Pedagogy in Early Modern Studies, Method and Praxis, and is leading a two-year Shirk-funded project that examines and digitally curates evidence of ownership and note-taking found in more than 130 surviving copies of Ralph Brooks' contentious 17th century book of heraldry, entitled A Catalog and Secession of the Kings, uh, Princes, Dukes, etc. of this realm of England. The first iterations of the digital series for this project and the Barnett project will be available by end of summer. And so at this point, I will turn it over to Scott and Blake to start their presentation. And during the presentation, if you have any questions, please do pop those into the Q&A box and we will happily answer them at the end. So Blake and Scott. Hello everyone. And yes, thank you again, Debbie. Um, just give you a quick section breakdown here. Um, I'll be starting here and we'll be talking a bit about process and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Schofield to speak about accession books and some more copy specific details of some of the copies. And um, then we'll come back to me and we'll talk a bit about tagging and genre and further considerations of the project. So, um, can everyone see the slideshow? Yeah, good. Good? Okay. In 1918, the Stratford, Ontario Grand Trunk Railway engineer, public intellectual, and avid book collector, John Davis Barnett, donated his private library of more than 42,000 books to the University of Western Ontario. 
The vast majority of the collection can still be found in Western special collections, main library stacks, and storage facilities. And the list of books are recorded in Barnett's hand over a series of accession books. Accession book number one, dated 1899, includes Barnett's enumerated listing of titles from his Shakespeareana collection, spanning nearly 60 pages and divided over numerous subsections. The accession book includes primarily 18th and 19th century titles with a smaller selection of 17th and early 20th century works. In short, it represents one of the largest, if not the largest private collection of Shakespeareana in Canada for its time. Over the past year, we have attempted to reassemble Barnett's Shakespeareana collection through a careful examination of the accession book, the online catalog, and when possible, through access to the more than 1,100 surviving books. Today, we will offer a retrospective account of the processes, challenges, and results of this work over the last year with special attention given to Barnett's collecting and classification system, as well as a special interest in unique copies. We'll also briefly discuss the digital potential for organizing, mapping, and visualizing this rich data set. The project began last March and, as you all know, was quickly undermined by the pandemic that we are still unfortunately in the midst of. Um, from the outset of the project, we immediately faced the problem of cataloging and examining a collection of books with very limited access to the copies themselves. We did, however, have two invaluable resources at our disposal, Barnett's accession book, as mentioned, and the library catalog. Approaching the collection from these two sources, we established two major goals and about a hundred minor ones. We were to recreate Barnett's Shakespeare collection according to his accession book, as well as the few texts that do not appear in it. And we wanted to gather as much information as possible in the text that Western still possesses, record it, and ultimately make this information available to the wider public for research and teaching purposes. Using Omni, Western's library catalog system, to track down Barnett's Shakespeare was a time-consuming and often difficult task. The catalog will occasionally indicate a Barnett donation statement, and Dr. Schofield had previously recorded some information about the earliest works in the collection, but by and large, we were simply tracking down every 18th and 19th century Shakespearean text in Western's catalog and recording the information to be later checked against the accession book and closely examined to see if the book contained the markers that indicated the copy was one of Barnett's elect. The 19th century alone has over a thousand confirmed copies, a number which still grows as we track down texts that eluded the wide net we had to cast. The first iteration of our list was quite simple. We modeled our entries after the style of 19th century catalogs and bibliographies some of which Barnett himself owned. We included location, author, title, publication details, one set of notes, and whether or not the Folger Shakespeare Library had it, and the call number. It soon became apparent, however, that we would need more categories to ensure we were to reproduce the copy information with as much detail and accuracy as possible. We also realized that it would be incredibly useful to provide direct links to the Folger Shakespeare Library. Um, uh, catalog, sorry. So researchers would be able to quickly compare Western's copy data with the data available through the Folger. Now, the Folger Shakespeare Library is the largest repository of Shakespearean in the world. The thinking is that if the Folger does have the same book, we can make use of their general notes to add important details and compare copies. If the Folger, if the Folger does not have the text, then we know that we are looking at something that is quite possibly very rare that would speak to the uniqueness of Barnett's collection. Alongside this thinking, we decided to provide links to the WorldCat page and, if available, Hattie Trust. WorldCat provides the locations of all copies known in other libraries. Having this information on hand was incredibly useful. For example, according to WorldCat, this first edition copy of Christian Lenny's Shakespeare for Schools, published in London in 1847, with original boards, is one of three in the world, at least that we know of. Hattie Trust is useful in comparing our copies against the digitized ones, although much of the important paratextual and bibliographic data can only be obtained and recorded through handling the copy, Hattie Trust allowed us to at least view textual data that would inform or correct previous notes on a text, like, for example, viewing two almost completely similar variants that were published in London and New York. 
As you can see, our next entry doubled in size. This process was and still is time consuming, but was absolutely necessary in ensuring we have an accurate and comprehensive list. Now, eventually the data became too big to keep in our catalog format and we had to move everything over to Excel. This enabled a smoother transition into an online database and allowed us to navigate and analyze the information with more ease. Here's a little snapshot right here. And this is probably only about 60% of the columns that are actually on the spreadsheet. Now, as you may all notice, although this is quite full, there are some large gaps in our entries. All of the copy specific notes, binding details and markers of Barnett were unavailable. But with the summer of 2021 came the opportunity, limited opportunity, for us to start looking at the books themselves in special collections. The most important task was to find all traces of Barnett and every Shakespeare text the library still possesses. These traces, for the most part, fall under three different categories, the Barnett book plate, Barnett signature, and the accession number. Barnett would also sometimes include when he acquired the copy and when he entered the data in the accession book. Dr. Schofield will talk a bit more about this, but briefly, here's what each of these traces looks like. On the left is the Barnett book plate, something that is probably recognizable to any Western student who has taken more than one book out of Weldon Library that predates 1918. This book plate is almost always placed on the front face down. Barnett's signature was usually found on the opposite facing end paper or beneath the book plate itself, followed by, if he includes it, the accession number. Of the copies that we have looked at so far, which is less than half of our list, somewhere around 450 texts, over 75% have contained Barnett book plates. 61 of the same number contain Barnett's signature. Now we're still formatting the entries of accession numbers in, in the copy for the spreadsheet, so I wasn't able to get an exact number, but Barnett signatures were almost always accompanied by an accession number. Roughly 60% contain numbers that correspond with the accession book. And these numbers were almost always accurate with the very occasional numerical mistake being entered by Barnett. The final or perhaps near final version of the list included the addition of an editor field. We wanted to ensure that the database would be useful to researchers working in different disciplines. Illustrators, compilers, translators, and editors are marked with different prefixes to allow users to track down specific clusters of collaborators, the text. We also included binding information in the copy specific notes. On top of this, we created separate fields for the corresponding number in the accession book, as well as the page number in accession book. We also included a tags field, but I'll discuss those in detail a bit further on. Oh. Although there are still many copies to examine and many fields to fill, we have, through the work of Christy Thompson at Western Libraries, moved the work over both the Dataverse and the Omeka database. The database will eventually be fully searchable and include images of each copy, as well as links to both the accession book and Omni catalog. This early iteration of the database you see on screen already allows us to search through the collection using specified fields and filter results accordingly. We still have a lot of work to do. There are at least 700 more copies to look at and photograph. But we have made considerable headway in both the work and process. And our hope is that the first section of the collection up to 1850 will be fully standardized and photographed for use in the coming months. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Schofield. All right, thanks, Blake. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Perfect. So when the Stratford, Ontario Grand Trunk Railway engineer, <clears throat> public intellectual and avid book collector, John Davis Barnett donated his private library of more than 42,000 books to the University of Western Ontario in 1918, he presented the collection with a series of accession books that he created as an inventory for his vast collection. Accession book number one, dated 1899, begins with two indexes. The first contains a listing of the various subsections of the Shakespeare collection, and the second provides a key to various abbreviations employed for individual entries. The subsections are listed as follows, and I read, sonnets and poems, reference books, calendars, almanacs, birthday books, quotations, Bible, religion, morals, eulogy, pictures and illustrations, Falstaff, life, biography and novels, forgeries and discussion of authorship, bibliography, book and museum lists, miscellaneous, 
collective editions of the plays, Hamlet, partial authorship, single plays and comments on, tales from Shakespeare and children's editions, sources on which he drew, discussion, study, and comments, special and technical knowledge, and finally, Stratford on Avon and Shakespeare's England. This index makes for easy searching. Users can turn to a subject, scan the list of entries over one or more pages, and ideally choose a book or books to study. Consider the section starting on page 10 entitled Pictures and Illustrations. Here, listed among the 42 works, we find Edward Dowden's Shakespeare Scenes and Characters, William Winter's Edwin Booth in 12 Dramatic Characters, G.F. Sargent's Shakespeare's England, illustrated in a series of landscape and architectural designs, Abraham Wivell's Studies of the Portraits of Shakespeare and Supplement, Seymour Eaton's Shakespeare Rare Print Collection, and Henry Noel Humphrey's Sentiments and Similes of William Shakespeare, bound in paper mache with chromiolithograph illustrations. Add to this the eight different printings of the Seven Ages of Man series with dates ranging from 1831 to 1889, and you start to get a sense of the scope of this collection. All of the titles are cataloged accordingly, or are they? As we continue through the list, we find Edith Nesbitt's The Children's Shakespeare, as well as J.V. Barrett's playful Shakespeare Fresh Chiseled in Stone. While well, both definitely qualify for inclusion, as they each contain copious illustrations, both could be included under Barnett's section entitled Tales from Shakespeare and Children's Editions. We might also ask why J. Moore Smith's massive illustrated edition of Macbeth um, is not placed under Macbeth in the single plays and comments on section. Well, we may move sequentially through Barnett's various classification headings in an orderly manner. His decision to attach works to single subject headings proves challenging, if not problematic. In each of these cases, Barnett must prioritize one subject over another when entering copies. And this problem persists beyond Accession Book One. Indeed, based on this Accession Book alone, it would appear that Barnett owned only but two early English imprints, but this is not the case. Most of his early English titles are located in a different Accession Book, where they are entered with various facsimiles, continental imprints, including five in Cannabula. These are just two of the entries shown here. Before we fault Barnett for adopting too simplistic a system of classification, we must remember the media he's working with. Entering titles by hand in a paper codex comes with certain limits. For one, you must predict how much space you will need for different sections, knowing you will continue to acquire new books after you make your list. This point is made clear in Accession Book 1 as only 60 of the 100 pages are filled. Some sections are entered in a neat hand, while others are crammed between entries or listed on the verso of the leaf as seen here. As you can see in these, this section on Coriolanus, you get a series of, of near sequential numbers in the 400s, um, but then you have these much bigger numbers, 26,000, 42,000, et cetera, uh, crammed in between entries. And this is a kind of clue to how Barnett was um, acquiring books and how he was then entering in an accession book uh, that he had to, had to guess uh, about um, as, he, as he acquired more material. There is evidence in Accession Book 1 that Barnett entered some 969 titles for the Shakespeareana before moving to the next sections in the book. On Dickens, the Brownings, Emerson, Thoreau, and others at the end. There is also evidence that he may have accumulated some 23,000 books by 1899. Such a big data set and only limited tools for organizing it. Indeed, to enter titles this way is a bit like working in Excel without copy and paste, or the ability to delete. In short, it requires a significant amount of guesswork. Now, to divide and classify one Shakespeare's library in 1899 was by no means unusual, but it was not al also not expected. In fact, a section of Barnett's accession book illustrates the various options for cataloging Shakespeare in print in the 19th and early 20th century. Under the subheading bibliography, book, and museum list, there are 17 entries ranging in date from Edmund Malone's sale catalog of 1818 to the Ryland's Tercentenary Exhibition Catalog for 1916. 
Looking more closely at these catalogs is important, for they show the diverse ways of cataloging similar collections. John Wilson's Shakespeareana, catalog of all the books, pamphlets relating to Shakespeare published in 1827, and one of the earliest in Barnett's list, uses publication date to organize some 204 editions, works of criticism, and specialized studies produced between 1692 and 1827, before offering a detailed listing of the early Shakespeare quartos and folios. In later 19th century printed Shakespeare catalogs, we begin to see more nuanced classifications and a significant growth in the number of titles listed. J.D. Mullen's Catalog of the Shakespeare Memorial Library at Birmingham contains more than 6,000 entries. While the individual and collected editions receive detailed descriptions and supplementary charts, the source material and criticism is arranged chronologically with no fuller subdivision. A similar approach is used in Franz Thim's Shakespeareana from 1564 to 1864, although his offers extensive listings of editions and commentaries in foreign languages. Specialized bibliographies, such as William Henry Wyman's bibliography of the Bacon Shakespeare controversy, offers an additional subset of Shakespeareana, but still follows the chronological approach used by others. Horace H. Morgan's topical Shakespeare is different, however, as it essentially takes existing catalogs, including Thims, and arranges entries by subject, much like in a 17th century commonplace book. The result is a catalog broken down by more than 50 subjects, several of which we find used by Barnett. Unlike other catalogs, Morgan has ignored the editions altogether, but he has also chosen not to include dates and place of publication for his entries. Nevertheless, what we see here is an attempt to sort the mass of printed Shakespeareana and a potential blueprint for the kind of headings adopted for Barnett's accession book. If Western Library Catalog has been essential for our reconstruction of Barnett's library during the pandemic, so too were the digitized pages of the accession book. In fact, fairly early on, I started to mark up the digitized manuscript with call numbers as I searched for copies, and those lists are still essential for determining how many of Barnett's books still reside in Western's collections. Following the list of subject headings found in Accession Book 1 comes a second list of abbreviations. Examples include BP for bookplate, EX for extra illustration inserted, PP for privately printed, WC for woodcut illustrations. Barnett employs additional abbreviations not found in this list as well. These include AUTOG for autographs and signatures by author or owner of a copy, interleave, copies with blank interleaves, and half B for bindings that are half bound. These abbreviations show Barnett's acute awareness of copy specific features, a subject of great interest to book historians today. While the abbreviations are helpful to understanding how Barnett valued his collection, these ink and pencil marks are but a starting point for considering the books in the collection and the possible connections between them. By looking to the surviving copies from Barnett's collection, we begin to see important material traces left unrecorded in the list. These traces inspire a different way of organizing the collection, one that moves away from subject classification and one that requires oscillating between and moving across Barnett's lists. Spotting Barnett books in Western's university collection, as Blake has shown us, is fairly easy, as they typically contain his book plate along with signature and accession number in pencil. In some cases, as in the example shown here, Barnett adds an additional date to record when the book was purchased or acquired. Such evidence has proven vital for reconstructing the Shakespeareana portion of Barnett's library. It has also led to some unexpected connections across Barnett's lists. One such example relates to the author, editor, and collector, James Orchard, Orchard Halliwell Phillips. Barnett owns several works by Halliwell Phillips, including editions of manuscript plays, studies in fairy mythology, discussions of Shakespeare's sources, and more. Of particular interest are several rare Hollywood produced facsimiles, a facsimile of the original indenture of the conveyance of over 100 acres of land, which was made by William and John Combe of Stratford-on-Avon to Shakespeare on the 1st of May in the year 1602, was, like many Halliwell Phillips imprints, privately printed. In Barnett's accession book, this large folio 
appears under sources as item number 738 and contains the book's measurements, 13.5 by 8.4 inches, and the word private. What is missing from the accession book entry, however, is any indication of Halliwell Phillips' initials, J-O-H-P, and his additional note on the limited run found in Barnett's copy, 25 copies only printed, and the woodblocks destroyed, April 1884. More than a mere annotation, the note offers important clues to the work's making and Halliwell Phillips' desire to restrict readership. It is one thing to produce a limited run, but quite another to destroy the printing materials required to produce any future copies. If Barnett's succession book offers important clues on copies, they are often partial and inconsistently employed. Consider another example. Unlike the giants of American Shakespeare collecting Henry Clay Folger and Henry Howard Furness, just to name two, Barnett did not own any of the early Shakespeare quartos or folios. However, he did own several restoration plays, including a number of Shakespeare adaptations. Barnett's copies of Nahum Tate's 17th century adaptations of King Lear and Coriolanus appear in his accession book under the single plays and comments on section. There are no special abbreviations for either of the entries, which are numbered 415 and 30, 435 respectively. However, each of the copies contains an added ink note on the back paste down reading C and P J O H P, that is collated and perfect James Orchard Halliwell Phillips, and a pencil note reading, quote, from the library of J.O. Halliwell Phillips Library, Mr. Sotheby and Co., July 1 to 4, 1889. Well, the first note directs us to Halliwell Phillips' ownership and his collating of the copy. The second highlights its place in the Halliwell Phillips sale administered by Sotheby in 1889. When we turn to that sale catalog, we find the two works together as lot 1114. In this case, looking to the copy leads us to another's library and the auction house that sold the book. In the larger context of this paper, the Halliwell Phillips books, including those authored, edited, owned, and even examples given as gifts, as shown here by him, provide a case for reorganizing Barnett's books, one where we make new connections both across the lists and to other libraries. Another important connection found across the list comes via another collector. Several books from the Barnett collection contain the inscription purchased at the sale of Joseph Crosby's Shakespearean Library. Crosby emigrated to the U.S. from England around 1843 and resided in the small town of Zanesville, Ohio. In addition to his being a grocer, he had one of the largest collections of Shakespeareana in the U.S. at the time. What made Crosby somewhat unusual is that despite his being an amateur scholar, he corresponded with some of the major editors and critics of Shakespeare during this period. The Crosby papers are held at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC. But what about the books? Crosby suffered serious financial and legal problems in the 1880s, and so had to sell off his library. Some of the books were purchased by the University of Michigan, but many others went up for auction in an 1886 sale catalog, in, or sale, sorry, in New York City. Crosby books are particularly valuable because he often annotated his copies. The quality of his scholarship was important enough to influence the work of Joseph Parker Norris, C.A. Ningleby, while also providing material for Furness's very own Hamlet. Among the various surviving Barnett Crosby books is a copy of Charles Jennings' editions of King Lear and Othello, published in 1770 and 1773, respectively. In his copy, Crosby offers three pages of notes on time in Othello. While well, the annotations are worthy of their own study and may be of value for future editors of the play, they might offer more. How might these annotated copies connect with and relate to the correspondence at the Folger? Were the notes meant for private study or were they an important stage prior to correspondence? In a 1979 issue of Shakespeare Quarterly, the late John Veltz recognized the value in Crosby's annotated books and made a call for scholars to notify him of any discovered copies. He knew there were Crosby books in Michigan and Wisconsin, but was unaware that there was a small store of them on the other side of the border. I have found 12 Barnett Crosby books to date, and I have no doubt there are more. The Crosby books in Barnett's collection requires we look across the list to various subjects, including the subject with the most entries in the accession book, that is discussion, study, and comment. On the first end paper, or volume one of Charles Ingleby's Shakespeare, The Man and the Book, 
Crosby has written, quote, kindly presented to me by my learned friend, the author, and he had dated the copy July 4th, 1877, Zanesville, Ohio. Ingleby's work was published in 1877, and so it was likely sent to Crosby soon after release. Once again, the Folger becomes important since in the catalog record for the letters of Clement Mansfield Ingleby are examples to Crosby. A simple inscription in this case can lead us to a better understanding of a particular scholarly network. It can make us reconsider the division between rare book and archive, while also making us rethink the bias that separates the advanced from the amateur scholar. It might also inspire us to look even further beyond Barnett's list. As just discussed, studying the Barnett collection can lead us to other collectors of Shakespeare, including figures like the American collector Joseph Crosby and British collector James Orchard Hollywell Phillips. A study of the collection can also expose local connections. Indeed, one of the important takeaways from researching Barnett's books, both those in his Shakespeareana collection and beyond, was that he often accumulated books from other prominent 19th century collectors in southwestern Ontario. This includes books from London, Ontario's Richard Maurice Buck, head of the As Asylum for the Assane and close friend and co-executor of the Walt Whitman Estate. Annotated books from the library of J.J. E. Linton, the Stratford, Ontario abolitionist who published material in Marianne Shad's anti-slavery newspaper, The Provincial Freeman. Books once belonging to Isaac Helmuth, Anglican bishop and founder of Huron, University College, and books once owned by members of the Shanleys, a family who emigrated from Ireland to settle in Thorndale in the 1830s. Focusing on local collectors' books in the Barnett collection leads to additional connections in the local book trade, including clues to where books were purchased, bound, exchanged, and more. Indeed, central to the Barnett reconstruction project is not simply finding and listing the books once in his collection, but cataloging the material evidence tied to the production, circulation, and reception of the copies, both before and after he accumulated them. The presence of such local and global connections can be seen in even the smallest of details, such as bookbinder and seller's tickets found on the front and back paste downs of several of the copies. British bookbinder tickets are most common, as shown in the examples seen here. Bone and Son and Wesley and Co. in particular are present on several of Barnett's books. Local examples include several early Kingston, Montreal, and Toronto-based binders and sellers. And a number of Barnett's books contain the ticket of the Stratford, Ontario bookbinder, W. Stone. In fact, there are more than 100 books bound by Stone in Barnett's collection, as so many are bound in a half le leather over marble board a configuration. Studying the books in Barnett's collection offers a reminder of the important material evidence found in individual copies. Studying Barnett's copies also points to the limits of his lists, for while he often notes the presence of autographed copies in his succession book, he never adds autographs for any of the Crosby books, nor does he record bookseller or binder's tickets. In searching for Barnett's books, we have now compiled a list of some 1,100 titles and have worked with more than 400 of Barnett's copies. One of the reasons for creating a digitized list of Barnett's Shakespeareana is so we can make what survives of the Shakespeare collection accessible in one place and more publicly known. It is also so that we can fill in the copy specific data found in and beyond the accession books. By copy specific, I'm referring to such things as annotations, autographs, bindings, book plates, book dealer notes, extra illustrations, gift inscriptions, interleaves, letters, prompt books, samobon, and more. It may require adding details relating to the transcribing of a letter from W.H. Wyman to Barnett, or adding copy notes for the interleaved annotations found in Barnett's Tragedy of Macbeth, A New Song. It may see us looking more closely at Crosby's penciled notes in Henry James Pye's comments on the commentators of Shakespeare, or Barnett's own notes on the scarcity of a limited edition. Each entry comes with a detailed description of the binding, including examples in contemporary marble boards or tree casts, or those that are still bound in the original publisher's paper boards. 
An online database also affords new possibilities for studying, seeing, and visualizing the collection that looks both to and beyond the list. In 2019, he and Ray alerted me to the holdings of Barnett's engineering papers and published articles that had been sent from Western in 1975 to Libraries and Archives Canada. In that transfer, a small selection of Shakespeareana was added, including two books with Crosby provenance. There is also a small batch of related ephemera, including reports, invitations, and several printed prospectuses for Shakespeare books in Barnett's collection, along with bundles of uncatalogued newspaper and magazine clippings. In this case, we see yet another reason to look beyond the accession book, for these items are not included in Barnett's lists and yet are arguably more valuable than many of the books themselves. As I patiently wait for my chance to travel to the US, to Michigan, to the Folger, and so on, as well as Ottawa to access additional Barnett materials, I continue to move within, across, and beyond accession book one. Now we'll return back to Blake. You're muted, Blake. There we go. Can you hear me now? Everyone see that okay? Yep. Thanks. If one were to examine the list now, they would see that the column most often left blank is the one titled tags. The process of tagging items for the use of search and research is quite familiar to most of us in the 21st century, but nonetheless, we've been hesitant to fully commit to a set of standardized tags that would be specific enough to be useful in targeted searches, while also broad enough as to not isolate each text from the rest. Tagging within this collection specifically requires us to fit the text into a genre or subgenre or definitive category that will affect when the text appears in a search. It begs the question, in this project concerned with the recreation of Barnett's collection, do we just adhere to the way he categorized each copy or do we create our own system of classification? <clears throat> this question bothered us over the past year. It still bothers us. The simple answer would be just to use Barnett's divisions, but as Amy J. Devitt reminds us, genre is a dynamic response to and construction of recurring situation one that changes historically and in different social groups that adapts and grows as a social context changes, unquote. Ultimately, we decided we had to make our own classification system as Barnett's categories were somewhat limiting. We needed these categories to be both informative enough for researchers exploring within their specific interests and varied enough to demonstrate the diversity of subject contained within the collection. We also needed to look at every copy to verify the contents and ensure the classification actually aligns with the subject matter of the text. Gems in, of Shakespeare, for example, isn't really about gems, in, as, or, as, or, as, or rather as straightforward as it sounds, about gems, whereas Shakespeare as an angler is actually about Shakespeare being an angler. The process of creating these tags also revealed important features about the collection that would never have been obvious had it been categorized in accordance with Barnett's accession book or regular subject headings. We noticed that there are a considerable amount of texts, at least 30 thus far, that are concerned with teaching Shakespeare. Several things stand out in this subsection. Many of the works are about tales from Shakespeare or stories from Shakespeare. And this is not entirely surprising as Shakespeare at this point was being integrated into British and American curricula during the 19th century. What is important is the number of female editors, compilers and authors that appear in this subsection of the list. Most of these works aren't just summaries of the Bard's plays. Mrs. Valentine authors Shakespearean tales and verse. Adelaide, Adelaide C. Gordon Sim edits and arranges Shakespeare's works for children. Anna Jameson writes an incredibly detailed work on the moral, poetical, and historical characteristics of woman. And Mary Cowden Clark writes about the girlhood of Shakespeare's heroines. Cowden Clark, of course, appears often. She wrote a book on Shakespeare's proverbs, was an editor for the complete works of Shakespeare in 1864, Along with her husband, Charles Cowden Clark, she wrote several pieces of criticism on Shakespearean style and the key to understanding his works. And most impressively, she was the compiler of the Shakespeare Concordance, a juggernaut of a text that acts as an index to every line in Shakespeare. Cowden Clark's Concordance replaced the old version and became the standard in the field. 
With the resurgence in scholarship of early woman Shakespearean editors, Barnett's collection becomes a valuable resource in identifying, locating, and studying the sort of material that would otherwise be difficult to accumulate using Barnett's or a standardized system. <clears throat> More broadly, the collection showcases the rising interest in the editing of Shakespeare's texts, the fascination with recreating Shakespeare's intended meaning in his works, fixing the faults of the last generation of editors, or altering the plays completely from their earliest printed editions, a fascination that grew until culminating in the new bibliography of the early 20th century. With this rise in interest came, to the, came the use of newer technologies and ways of studying the Bard's works. This copy of Richard II with an introduction by P.A. Daniel, for example, is a facsimile reprint of the second quarter of the work printed in 1598. With the rise of photolithography, these sorts of facsimiles became quite popular in the mid to late 19th century. Barnett had several of them. But as anyone looking into the history of Shakespeare and editing well knows, this was not enough for those textual scholars. The next step, so to speak, are copies like this double text Dallas type of The Tempest with an introduction by F.J. Furnival, published in 1895, which contains the facsimile of Shakespeare's first folio on the right page and the modern edited text by Charles Knight on the left. Texts like these were useful for comparing or more likely critiquing the work of contemporary editors for a burgeoning collective of scholars who had no access to the rare historical texts. Now, some of this desire for reproducing accurate original texts may have been because of the forgeries by William H. Ireland during the end of the 18th century. William Ireland, who claimed to have found, but actually forged, many documents written in Shakespeare's hand, including four plays, was ferociously defended by his father, Samuel Ireland, who believed the documents to be genuine. They were proved not to be quite quickly by Edmund Malone. Barnett's collection has many of the works that were involved in the scandal the claims, confessions, and disputes that were made. And Barnett did not just collect works only of interest to scholars. In his book, Steam Driven Shakespeare, Alan R. Young reminds us that between the 1830s and 1880s, an immense cultural shift occurred. Shakespeare's text became the property of all, quote, a phenomenon apparent in the exploding popularity of illustrated texts of Shakespeare. Barnett's collection contains many of these consumable and affordable works, as you can see here, this is a um, painting of uh, Shakespeare's birthplace. And here, another illustration from Midsummer Night's Dream. <clears throat> Barnett's collection contains many of these consumable and affordable works that were meant to be enjoyed by all. Of course, with this massive influx of print material from the 19th century, so came the rise of access to the media and the mass dissemination of less than sound ideas. The 19th century saw the genesis of the Baconian Shakespeare theory. For those of you who do not know, the theory posits that Sir Francis Bacon, famed early modern courtier, philosopher, and scientist, was actually the author of all of Shakespeare's plays. Barnett clearly had a specific interest in the Baconian theory, even though, as Dr. Ian Ray asserted in the presentation in 2019, was not a believer in the theory himself. He collected ridiculously titled texts like Francis Bacon versus Phantom Captain Shakespeare or the works of supposed code breakers, like this copy of the bilateral cipher of Sir Francis Bacon. And of course, the work of Ignatius Donnelly, master conspiracy theorist of the 19th century, who believed Bacon encoded cryptic messages into the printed versions of Shakespeare's plays. Donnelly's work and the theory in general became quite prominent. And a quick glance at this section of Barnett's collection speaks to the level of popularity achieved through the mass production of the medium perhaps a phenomenon a bit too familiar to all of us here today. As Dr. Schofield alluded to earlier, we also needed to include tags for inscriptions or autographs. For as you can see right here, this was a revisal of Shakespeare's text signed by the Duke of Grafton in 1779, who, if our dating is correct, um, was uh, served, a, served a very short stint as the British Prime Minister in 1769 or 1770. Um, and something like here, this is signed by the famous 19th century actor, Charles Keane. We needed to fall, also figure out the appropriate way of tagging works that weren't in the Shakespeare accession book that would be of interest to Shakespeareans, like this 1632 play quarter of Albu Mazar by Tom Tompkins that may contain contemporary markings. As you can see, we often felt and still felt like Barnett, squeezing later entries under different subheadings 
or just placing them in other books entirely. The process of figuring out how searchable and unique each entry will be is still an ongoing one. But one thing is clear. Barnett's collection speaks to the idea of the universal library, one formed on the basis of collecting as much information about any range of subjects in order to inform and provide a broader picture of genre, interest, topic, or controversy, which allows us to recognize clusters of new and interesting avenues of research that may have not been apparent when the collection was first brought to Western, or that may escape the eye of a scholar offering a critical history of a field. In a way, working with this collection can reveal to us more Jamesons and Cowden Clarks, demonstrate unique histories of editorial practices and scholarship, and offer insight into the spread of unfounded ideas as new technologies emerge. I myself have found criticism that I was unaware of that was useful for my own dissertation chapter. The Shakespeareana is just a small portion of Barnett's vast contribution to Western's library. Our hope is that this work at collecting, identifying, and investigating the first entries in Barnett's accession books demonstrates the potential for the immense amount of novel research avenues and teaching opportunities that Barnett's collection has to offer. Thank you. So if anyone has any questions, um, please enter them into the Q&A and, um, and we'll see if we can answer them. Okay, and I'm seeing a few come up. Um, from Menina, um, did Barnett ever publish any scholarship on Shakespeare? You want me to take that one, Blake? Um, little bits, um, a little bits in, um, periodicals and so on. There's also a strange book I have found at the, um, in the catalog of the University of Michigan, um, which assigns Barnett as author. I'm not so sure this is true, but I need to look into this a bit more. Um, he did have um, um, an investment as, as mentioned, or Blake mentioned, in the Shakespeare Bacon controversy. Um, and I, so I see him a little bit like Crosby with a bit less publication. That is, he's, he's He's sending letters, tons of letters. And so he's clearly writing on Shakespeare and is interested in it. Uh, but in terms of official publication, it's, it's fairly minimal. Um, but we also have to consider the fact that he is a, um, an engineer <laughs> and, he, and he publishes uh, widely in engineering journals and so on. Um, but that's a great question and one that we still need to look a bit more into. Okay, so there is another question um, from Mike. Um, thanks for this, fascinating. I'm interested in what is or isn't in the Barnett collection. Did he have any vulgarized editions, reworkings of Shakespeare to appease contemporary tastes and morals? Any sense he had sympathy or not for such adaptations? I'm, I'm, we can probably both answer this, but yeah, I'm, he had quite a few. Um, I mean, he even had Nahum Tate's Lear as well, changing the ending, um, but also quite a few um, late 18th century um, and 19th century um, sort of uh, recreations of Shakespeare's plays, either in musicals or in uh, three act shorter plays. So um, if, if that's what you're asking, he had quite a few of them, whether or not he actually liked them um, is unclear. I don't think we found any notes that indicate it. Do you have anything further about it, Dr. Schofield? Yeah, it's, it's hard to know. And, and some of the works you're talking about, Blake, I know there's a whole pile of these works that end with a travesty. A travesty, yeah. yeah Hamlet, a travesty. Macbeth, a travesty. Um, it's tricky because one of the things with Barnett, remember, at the, as we both started with, this is a collection of 42,000 books. And the Shakespeare portion, while significant, is still a kind of pebble within that larger collection. There's always a sense to me that Barnett is, is attempting uh, to um, create a universal library um, and, and, and with intentions to, to give it away. It's something that uh, Professor Ian Ray, who will speak in September, knows much more about. But, the, but this idea of, of where he sympathizes and so on is quite tricky um, because he, you know, we don't find clues of that in the annotations. It's more, more of his annotations have to do with what he has, what he's looking for, um, and what he's still after. In fact, there's a wonderful page in one of the accession books that says, uh, copies yet to be obtained. Um, so I can only imagine him getting on and off the train 
going down the eastern seaboard and so on, um, feverishly looking for these copies and somehow pulling off his eight hour day or 10 hour day or whatever he was working at the same time. Okay, I'm just gonna check. I think, I think that's the end of our question. So I want to thank um, uh, both of our presenters, Scott and Blake, for such a great, um, oh, sorry, there's one more question popping up, but there's actually more, <laughs> sorry. All right, so from Janelle, um, here's an oddball question. I'm tracking down the library of a collector here in Victoria, who is an exact contemporary of Barnett. Did you run across the name Harrison Garside anywhere in your research? Garside corresponded with other book collectors. I don't, I, so far we haven't gone across everything. I just saw that there and I um, double checked to see if we've looked at anything yet. But again, we've only looked at, yeah, around 450. So we could very well find someone um, later on, whether that be a book plate or an inscription. Um, but so far, no. All right. Um, from Henry. Um, we at the Cronin Observatory are still hunting for how we came to have many um, what I call civil engineering models. Um, one of our models is denoted as being from the Barnett collection. I think I know what that model is. I think that's the, the canon that was uh, the time canon. The other models are unsigned but have striking similarities being from major cities in the world, Paris, London, St. Petersburg, uh, Philadelphia. So do we have any information at all about um, other artifacts in the accession books or just books? Uh, so far, I, I've um, only found books, but I've, I've been aware of these sort of objects and, and it's really curious to think of Barnett uh, not being satisfied enough with his massive book collection, but that he wants to collect um, other physical objects. I also wonder if, if an answer to that question might come uh, via um, Library and Archives Canada, where the engineering papers and the bundles are. There might be material there tied to, to some of the more scientific material. Um, but having said that, we also need to uh, go through these accession books uh, with a fine tooth comb and with limited access, we're only starting to be able to do that. One of our hopes, and I, I think uh, working with Western libraries is to digitize the accession books um, and transcribe them so that we can see fully what's there. Um, and think about, you know, if I, as I was saying about the connections across the list, um, but also across the accession books. So I don't think I answered the question really, but I think there's a couple of places you might get the answer to uh, that question that uh, through Library of Archives Canada and so on. Right. Thanks. Um, and here's a question for you, Scott, uh, from Mark. Uh, very interesting indeed. Do you happen to know if the Shanley family is related to Colonel James Shanley, who lived in the Shanley townhouse, 301 Piccadilly Street? Wow. Um, I feel like this is a trap question. Um, I, I think it might be. I don't know. Um, the Shanleys I know of, and there is a James. James is, I, be, I believe, the father. Um, the Shanleys come to sort of across to Canada in the 1830s from Ireland. Uh, the father training at uh, Trinity College Dublin. And I know he, there's many sons and daughters. Um, and so one of the tricky parts about working with the Shanley material is which Shanley are you dealing with? Um, there's various book plates too, um, but I do all the Shanleys I've come across are based out of Thorndale, just about 25 minutes from London, Ontario. So I don't know um, uh, about that question specifically, but it's not impossible. Okay, so um, in the slide from um, an anonymous attendee, in the slide of the three volumes by Clark, it looks like one has an elastic wrapped around it. If it is, um, he recommends that we remove it and use unbleached cotton tie instead. Um, I'm it, not sure it, that we have any elastics. In no, the it's, a, it's, it's a cotton yeah. tie. Yeah. It's a cotton tie. Yeah, okay. I, I was going to say, yes, I would recommend that as well. <laughs> Yes. All right. All right. Let me just see if I, I just don't want to miss any here. Um, so we've got um, MJ um, 
uh, one of our faculty on campus asking, it seems odd that Barnett is based in Stratford where the festival was eventually founded 40 to 50 years after he dies. Is there some Shakespeare ecology in that town that attracts this attention to Shakespeare, whether books or performance? This sounds like a good question for um, uh, Ian. <laughs> the, the, the talk that's coming up next in September, Ian would probably be able to answer this very well. I think I think he, Ian might turn that question into an argument. In other words, <laughs> that that that's what he is is advocating for, and I so I'm going to leave that for Ian because he knows way more about the history of Stratford and the sort of. Um, the early period before the festival and the possible connections between Barnett's collecting and the foundation of the Shakespeare Festival. But it, it's a great question and, um, and one that I'm excited to learn more about too. MJ, we're going to record that and um, we will be bringing it to Ian in the next, in the next talk. Um, now, let me just uh, get here. Okay, so from Matthew, we have, can you say more about Barnett's connection to the Shanley family? Thorndale House Library. I'm interested that books came from that collection via Barnett because we also have books from there that don't have the Barnett book plate. So there seems to be an independent Shanley Western connection. I guess I'll take this one too, Blake. Um, the, this is a great question. Uh, in fact, most of the Shanley books, and I know librarians at Western have been tracking them. Patrice Regier, for instance, is one of them. It was found, I think, up, up close to 200. Shanley books uh, found in Western collections. And I would say the vast majority don't have Barnett plates. Um, so they're coming independent of Barnett's library. Um, but Barnett, as I mentioned also when talking about the Helmuth collection uh, at Huron, he seemed to have an eye on anybody who collected in the area. And so I can't help but think that whether he got them directly through the Shanleys or through those or secondhand, um, there is some sense that he is, he is aware of the Shanley family and their libraries. But on the whole, um, most of them are actually not with Barnett book plates. It's only through doing this work and seeing copies again that Blake and I have started to find, find a few um, with uh, Shanley book plates, and in some, kind, some cases, inscriptions. Um, so this is a kind of a in, or in progress uh, question because we're still we're learning as we go every time we get access and see 30 more books um, it changes how we see the relationships between many of these southwestern Ontario collectors um, it's a great question and I hope to have a better answer uh, than what I just gave down the road uh, we have another question from David apart from the bacon works on the authorship question is there a grouping related to the Earl of Oxford um I think that it was you. Uh, Bacon was the prime candidate up until something like 1916, um, early 20th century. If there were other candidates, so that was the most popular theory. If there were other candidates, he might have some things on it. Um, he does have quite a few uh, pieces from and copies from the Bacon Society, um, which and I'm, actually he even has an invitation, a photolithographed one, and then a custom one by uh, Robert Masters Tybalt. Um, so if there was something about other candidates for the non-Shakespeare argument, um, they would probably be there, but um, nothing substantial for sure. Okay. And uh, the next question, um, Henry has a message for you. Thanks Scott for the suggestion. We tried Stratford with no luck. And Alicia um, is saying, as asking, did Landon take any information from Barnett's note copies yet to be obtained and try to source those books? Sorry, Deb, could you repeat that? I, yeah, I'm sure. Part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, did Landon take any information from Barnett's note copies yet to be obtained and try to source those books? Ooh. Um, I don't know, but I, yeah. my guess is given that Landon was key to brokering the deal to get the accession books or to get the collection to Western, and also celebrated uh, Barnett consistently, even in the years after Barnett's death. I think I would be surprised if he didn't do a bit of that for sure. Uh, again, to answer that question, we need to look more carefully at the archival, archival remains uh, tied to Landon and Barnett 
And I keep thinking, for instance, I know I only mentioned briefly about uh, material related to abolition and anti-slavery, uh, but there is no doubt because this was a major area of Landon's research, especially in the Underground Railroad in the Canadian American context. Um, and given Barnett's large collection of that material, there has to be overlap there somewhere. And so this sourcing that Alicia is pointing to, I have no doubt that that's there. Uh, but again, we can't really answer that till we get uh, look more carefully at the archives. All right. I have another question here. I think I might be breaking up a little bit again, but um, if you can hear this, um, out of curiosity, why was the collection not assessed in this way or any way at the time it was donated? Um, so that's, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to that question except to say that when it was donated, um, Barnett actually was asked to come and uh, be the librarian at Western, which he was for the first, um, probably uh, not quite a decade um, after he donated it. I think he passed away, I can't remember the exact date, but in the late uh, 1920s. And um, so he was continuing just to busily collect books, even after he donated the volumes and came to Western. Um, as librarian, he continued to, to purchase books. Um, so thank you, Manina. He uh, passed away in 1926. And so, um, uh, and after that, um, I think the, the emphasis was just to build a library. I'm not sure that there was the foresight at that time to, um, or maybe the resources or the time uh, to, to start doing that kind of work. So you just start building a library and um, uh, we're looking back now and, and, and seeing the value in all of the collecting and the, uh, uh, the accumulation of it, but I'm not sure exactly then that that would have been seen. Let me just check here. All right, so um, from Mark, you showed us Mary Cowden Clark's Heroines of Shakespeare. Is Clark's Concordance part of the Barnett collection? Yes, unfortunately, I didn't have an image of it at the time, but it is. Um, and I'm just looking at it right now, um, the notes, and it actually has a Shanley book plate on it as well. So, um, but yes, we do have that as well. And it, it, it was um, also a Barnett. It looks like the uh, Shanley one was a faded ghost image of the book plate and it has an inscription as well for W. Shanley. Okay. I think that is all our questions. Let me give one more check. Yes, I think that that is all of our questions and I think we're close to time. So, um, I'd like to thank um, Blake and Scott very much for all of your work on this project and for this presentation. And I hope that everyone enjoyed it. And uh, there's some links in the chat. If you would like to have uh, more information about Barnett, um, you can certainly go to the links and they'll take you to that information. If you would like any more information from uh, Western Libraries, uh, myself, Scott or Blake, you can um, contact me on the Western Libraries website and we'd be happy to respond. So thanks so much everyone for attending. I hope that uh, we see you at our next webinar in the Barnett series in September. Um, take care and have a good day. Bye-bye.